uh, since 06, it's been great. Since I've, I've never had to mess with the wines. Yeah. I mean, um, and we have 06 Monument, which you can try some of these, but you know, picking at 22.6 and 06, I, I mean, it was just a, you know, people ask me how did the change happen? I mean, I tried a couple things in 03 and 04 um, with a couple of different lots, um, experimenting, so to speak. Um, certainly backed off in 04, but the wines are still hovering in that 14 to 14.2 range. Um, and still some didn't seem to kind of have that energy that I wanted. And, um, you know, finally in 06, I was, you know, sampling the fruit, crush it up in the bucket, and it was like, wow, this tastes really good, and it's dark, tastes like, it has this great vibrant acidity. Um, you know, let's, you know, test the bricks, and it's like, wow, this is 22.8. Yeah. And uh, it was, uh, I don't know, so let's go for it. And frankly, it ended up being, um, I don't know, there are people, we made the wines at our crush facility in 06, and they, uh, you know, one winemaker, I'll leave him unnamed, asked me if I was making rosé. <laughs> it's just, it was pretty funny to, um, but it's interesting now for, you know, him to taste the wine and, and see what the difference is. But, uh, you know, also just handling the wine and the winery kind of had to put on a different hat because I got accused in the past of being a Syrah maker, making Pinot. Um, I was you know, doing a lot of punch downs, um, being pretty aggressive, more new oak, um, different Cooper, a lot of he heavier toast. And now I've backed off and... Um, you know, I do one pomo every day, sometimes not at all. I visited Grivo a few years back, and he said, he, you know, not to get fixated. I think people get fixated on someone's technique, yeah. um, but you try it for yourself, and I, I like the results. Yeah. You know, it seems, you know, sometimes as a winemaker, it's like better to know, like, when to back off and not do something. You just kind of let the wines make themselves, and, uh, um, again, it just seem, it seems to have worked out. I mean... Again. And, and the, wine, the wines taste like Pinot Noir, and I think that's one of the things that's difficult is when you're trying to make wines that uh, you know, fit kind of a, a little bit more consumer profile, they, they have a tendency to lose the character of Pinot Noir. And you know, Pinot Noir to me should be very red-fruited, and it's cranberry and cherry and strawberry. And, and, and I think when, you, when you're going in another style, and you know, as they say, people make Pinot like they're making Syrah, you, know, you get these kind of blueberry and dark-fruited flavors out of Pinot, and that's not really what I'm looking for in terms of a food pairing. Um, you know, if I'm looking for classic styles of right. Pinot, you know, it's like you're gonna have duck or squab or something like that, and you want you want more red fruited flavors. Right. I think you're gonna get that. You know, this approach you tend to get that more Pinot character, which which I like. Yeah, you know? it's funny you say that because that's what I was you know when I was preparing to kind of to talk to you about all this stuff. It was you know, exactly what I'm telling everybody out on the road. I'm talking about these wines. It's just uh, Pinot Noir being red fruit, you know, this kind of lacy texture, the transparency. And it's interesting, this, I was in New York last week and just kind of talking through something with people and it was um, transparent aspect to be able to see, I think you taste the vineyards more. Yeah. They're not being hidden by um, this kind of over sappiness and, you know, candied fruit glycerin that's kind of there that I think, I don't think in, you know, the earlier wines, I, well, I think they're kind of getting burnt out of it. You know, you can hide a lot of the, the character, I think, of the vineyard, I think, under, you know, wood and, yeah. uh, you know, overtly candied kind of sappy fruit. I like the, you know, I find that there is a little bit of, a, of an astringency in the wines, and I really like that because to me, you know, wine's kind of an adult beverage. You know, it, it's like if you're, if you're drinking, if you like things that are a little bitter or um, not just sweet like soda pop. Right. And, you know, in the presence of food, I think wine should have that little bit of a foil. Uh, and, and so many of the, of, of the California wines, to me, they just finish sweet. And if I'm eating wine with food, I don't necessarily want a wine to just finish sweet and ripe. It's different if you're just tasting a flight of wines and trying to, to judge them and what tastes good on its own. But especially with a meal, uh, I think you need that balancing uh, character and that can be you know, acidity and astringency and it's not just acidity because a lot of people just acidulate the wine right. um, but then what you find is that the acid doesn't match the fruit part profile in the wine you know it's like if you in inject a strawberry with sugar it doesn't make the strawberry more ripe you know you can tell where the ripeness of the fruit is and when you when right. you're just adjusting it it seems out of balance and and these wines seem balanced they have they have an acidity but it's not a, it, it doesn't stick out like a sore thumb, like here I'm the acid. 
you know, it's part of an integral part of the wine. Um, and I try to find that out. But if I'm going to sell this wine to somebody, I, I, I'm trying to figure out, do, do they want that sweet, rich, ripe finish? And if they do, I'm not going to sell them their wines. Um, but I, I, I think that uh, if you find people that are looking for that sort of profile and that taste, which I personally like, uh, you know, I think this is one of the best examples of, you know, of the, of the kind of crop of, of wines that fit into that category. Right. Mm -hmm.